Here's something from my day-to-day -day life, which has been eating away at my RPG brain. You may have noticed that when you're at a wedding or a funeral, and it's not a religious occasion related to your own personal beliefs, and there might be some rites which are performed at that religious occasion, which everyone's partaking of. It could be that there's some charcoal placed on foreheads, some anointing with holy waters or oils. There might be some blessed food, be it apples, bread, or wine that is partaken of, and it is a transmission of divine power, at least in the eyes of the people who hold to that faith. Well, this is the part that relates to RPGs. Never once in all my time playing role-playing games has anyone so much as blinked or batted an eye when a cleric of a religion or a faith, a god, to whom they don't adhere, starts performing one of these rites on them. And for that matter, clerics seem to freely give their magic. No one seems to really contemplate, am I recognizing the power of this deity, or is this a guy who just knows some secret 33rd degree gobbledygook that he's been initiated into because he's paid the special fees and gone through the special initiations? Who the f*** is the cleric? And what in terms of divine intervention or religious energies is happening when they do magic? That's what I'm going to ask you in this video. The word cleric is pretty indistinct as far as what kind of role this person is in, who happens to be a really iconic member of every D&D family that I've been a part of over the years. Sometimes this person is a priest, a real sworn member of some sort of religious order. In a polytheistic or henotheistic culture, the lay people might acknowledge many different gods and many different priesthoods. And in this role, it seems pretty comfortable who this person is. A priest of Apollo can walk around ancient Greece and do various heroic deeds, and people are probably not going to be particularly upset. Even a priest of Hades, this might fit well in. But if we look a little closer at the sort of cultures that we're presented in D&D &D worlds, we start to hear something like churches coming through as far as these various religious organizations. They're very concerned with the welfare, with the spiritual well-being, and even the afterlife of lay people. In other words, they're starting to get a little bit orthodox or, or organized with the beliefs that they want regular day-to-day -day adherence of their faith to cleave to. And it's in this default kind of medieval-esque mode that we see most religions presented in D&D settings. If you're going to follow one god, you have to devote all your energies to that particular god and often keep by a particular code of conduct. Pathfinder and Galarian kind of have gone all in on this, and the various faiths are described as having their own various religious manuals and holy books. And the provenance of those is sometimes alleged to be divine. In other words, that uh, an agent of the deity or the deity themselves gave this holy document as something to live by. In, in that vein, if you don't believe in that religion, as a layperson, as a fellow adventurer, another member of the party, what starts happening when that guy who's a priest of abattoir starts making magical hand motions and chanting for the intervention of his deity in this moment? What's happening to your inner spiritual being. You might even call it an immortal soul, depending upon your character's beliefs. How do you feel about that? Is that a conversion experience, or is that a, an intervention that is unwelcome? I've never had these discussions, and I'm starting to ask, why? Now, an alternative path to priests, be they polytheistic, henotheistic, or monotheistic coexisting cults in a world 
is something like initiates to mystery cults. People who are part of an organization which might be like Mithraism in the ancient times, or perhaps the Masons in the present day, who know some secrets. And these people are students of the divine. They're very um, interested in trying to improve their uh, spiritual well-being. And they have often some organized procedures for this. And they may even have meetings where some are welcome and others are not. And this goes into inner circles of more and more secrets about whatever sort of divine power they're accessing. So in this case, the cleric is someone who just knows these secret mysteries. And you, as a layperson, you can believe that these secret mysteries might be divine in nature or merely magical in the same way as the wizard in the party has magic. And it's sort of just something that that guy believes but it's not necessarily true or false. It's just healing magic. It's just a feel-good blessing that happens to improve your luck. It's materially true that this divine magic is working, and in many settings, it's even possible to consult with materially real gods. But even given those two things, it may not be demonstrable that the divine magic which is happening to you right now is actually happening as a conduit to a particular deity. In other words, it, it may not be any skin off your back because there's no way of knowing if Bob the priest really has access to the divine energies of his god or if he's just a really holy, pious guy. This is another question, which I find is not only unanswered, but also unasked. Another possibility about the nature of the cleric is they may be some sort of Gnostic person, someone who's a lay person who's really devoted themselves to a lot of religious practice and has started to intuitively receive some revelations about how to do this divine magic because they're just so nice. Now we start to get into really interesting territory where some faiths may have an organized priesthood and some orthodoxies, and they may also have some people who are claiming to be receiving revelations from their deity, and those two may come into contact. In other words, there may be clerics who are priests, and clerics who are not priests, but they may be receiving their divine power, or believe that they are, from the same divinity. So that's a big info dump of questions, which maybe not all of us want to ask, answer or really have put upon us when we decide to play a cleric or when we decide to create a fantasy world necessarily, but they're out there. They're things that can come up and maybe will come up in your own D&D games. Which brings us to the turning point of this video. There is one question which I think is before all world building game masters, which is before you and your group together perhaps to discuss when you start role-playing in a fantasy world where there are these divine powers and abilities, where there are monsters that claim to represent iconic parts of the afterlife or be conduits for the divine, and the question is of the mystery of faith. Are the gods real? Is the afterlife a true thing? Is there any way for that empirical knowledge to be acquired in these fantasy worlds? Because here in our own world, there are things that can't be known. And it's part of why we call religions faiths. Because people have to take it on faith that these things which they've been taught are true. And they have to believe this in spite of not being able to do experiments to gain this knowledge. I can tell you that the world is round and you can go do an experiment. I can tell you that astronauts landed on the moon, and I hate to break it to anyone who's suffering from any kind of insanity watching this video, but it is possible to fly a satellite with a few million dollars and a contract from SpaceX, and you'll be able to 
look at the actual landing site where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took a walk in 1969. You may even be able to see their real footprints depending upon the quality of your camera. These are empirical truths here in our own world. Are the gods and the connection between divine magic and those gods and the connection between angels and demons and the afterlife and possibly the gods, is that all empirically true within your fantasy worlds that you're role-playing in? Or are these articles of faith? Because there's an opportunity cost to just taking it as a given, to, to making these real true things. And that's that, for one, you, you may lose these moments where people start to second guess what just happened to them when they witness divine magic, when they witness divine agents. They, they don't ask questions any longer necessarily about what's going to happen to their immortal soul if a cleric of an evil god gives them a blessing because they know that it, it, it'll be okay or they know that it really won't. That's an interesting fantasy to have that true knowledge and to be able to act upon it, which in some ways we never can have here on our own planet. I don't really want to get into a lot of debate about that topic. And the reason that I don't want to get into the real world stuff right now in any depth, in addition to the possible subscriber law, <gasps> is because the question about the fantasy world building and the shortcomings of it uh, is really a big one on my mind. I don't think that these questions have been adequately asked. And especially lately, there's so much debate about racial stat bonuses and about the essential evil of certain humanoid races in most D&D &D settings. And those things were included based on the idea that either they're different sci-fi species, which have some biological natures that are kind of deeply ingrained in evolutionary processes which brought them about, or they were included in the game because myths are true in those worlds that we were playing in. The orcs were really created out of clay by the evil god Melkor, for example. And in that case, there's intelligent design. It's, it's not questionable at all. There's no mystery to what the origins of consciousness are. There was really a spark ignited by Apollo on a high mountain which gave man the ability to know things. For the most part, D&D worlds and even the implied D&D setting has been affirmative about the mystery of faith. It's a solved mystery. Myths are true, gods are real, and... The creation of the world happened in a way which is neither geologic nor biologic or evolutionary, in which case so much of the angry shouting that people are doing on Twitter is disconnected because this is a fantasy where gods are real in a material way, whereas our own planet, those things are... It's an awkward thing to have to talk about within RPGs, but... That disconnect is something which maybe we're not really being as recognizant of. And the reason to be recognizant of this disconnect is to recognize the opportunity that we have to maybe let the mystery of faith remain an open one. There's some benefits here, which I think are manifold. The first one is in the cleric's realm. It's a role-playing one. That struggle to really keep the faith. To really believe that what you're doing is being a conduit for your deity without real knowledge of whether that's true. Maybe people start telling you things about where your divine magic comes from that really unsettle and shake your foundations. A fighter can have a conflict of interest over whether he's really on the side of good or whether he's just become a mercenary, a pawn. And in the cleric's corner, what are those sorts of deep inner conflicts that we can leave open to have, to experience, and to role play if we leave the mystery of faith unsolved? Another side to this is about the problem of evil. If in our fantasy world the mystery of faith is case closed, then that means that evil is persisting in this fantasy world. 
in spite of the divine being able to stop it. Or maybe it even means that there are evil divinities that are really perpetrating this stuff or furthering it. And it often leads to a paradigm of dualism where the little people in the middle, the followers of these different divinities are duking it out in a kind of cosmic chess. That's a worldview here on our planet, which is um, no less or more valid than other spiritual worldviews. But it starts to become materially true in the fantasy world if the mystery of faith is solved. That validity and invalidity to different worldviews start to restore constrict role-playing, starts to change the different kinds of people that you're going to meet in these fantasy worlds. M maybe, maybe not for the richer and more vibrant world-building experience. So there we have another opportunity cost to a case-closed mystery of faith in our fantasy world-building. Here's another. We keep seeing these polytheistic faiths, these differing temples, differing gods down the street from one another, and all sharing a common mythology, and maybe even providing different community services to lay people concurrently. Sometimes they might be more like churches, and you have to follow and pledge yourself to one god or another, but their validity, the mythology of these gods, is all shared. They, they're part of a divine family often. What you don't see is wholly other understandings of spiritual reality. Some examples from our own planet might be things like animism, pantheism, or Buddhism, which don't really concern themselves a great deal with whether there are deities on high, be them singular deities or manifold ones. Remember how we began this video asking the question of who is the cleric? Well, the likelihood that the cleric is a practitioner of a faith tradition where deities aren't particularly important gets a lot lower in a world where the mystery of faith is solved and gods authentically exist. And there's a narrower band for the answers to who your cleric can be in that sort of world. So to recapitulate here, the question of who is the cleric and what is the nature of their divine spells is intimately tied up with the question of the mystery of faith and whether it's really a thing in the fantasy world that you're playing Dungeons and Dragons or a similar game in. A cleric can be a hermit, a mystic, a Gnostic layperson receiving revelations from afar. They could be a monk. They could be a traditional priest, the sort that caters to a congregation, ministers to the sick, or perhaps one that is pledged to a temple of a mystery cult, as in the days of ancient Earth. There are many questions, but perhaps the most salient is, how does your cleric experience the mystery of faith? Is it a matter of doubting whether the divine is real, or is it wondering whether you really are as special and in a relationship with the divine head, or if you're out here on your own, merely in the wild west of the real world? Who is the cleric? That's what I put to you. It's an uncomfortable question because of how many contentious topics it gets close to out here in the real world. But in spite of that discomfort, I think that it is a question that is worth having answers to, both in your own world building as a game master and in collaboration with your players when you work to answer the questions of who their characters are in the world. Why? Because... You're going to spend hundreds of hours as this character, and if details like this get left in the dirt or glossed over, then your relationship, even if it is long-term with a character, could end up being shallower and less rich than it could have been if these answers were discovered. And that's the sort of thing that I do here on my channel that you may not see in other places in the RPG YouTube space. I will tell you that I found a new channel that I'm very interested in that asks similarly difficult questions called The Dungeon Inn. And I would recommend that you take a look and head over there and see what sort of work he's doing. In the meantime, watch more of my videos, like and subscribe, and stay tuned for next time where I promise we will get back to some lighter fare.